Hello, everyone. We are ready for the next session. So, 2018 has seen rapid progress in the development of security token ecosystem, and regulators across the globe have grown equally receptive. What you're about to see isn't a panel, but rather a living room chat. That's because all the guys here, led by Ziv Kainan, the moderator, are good friends who are extremely excited about the development and promotion of STOs. So, Ziv, please take the stage. So uh, <clears throat> thank you, Michael, and uh, thanks uh, everybody that's here today to hear about uh, the security token ecosystem or digital as asset uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, this emerging ecosystem is uh, trying to connect uh, real-world assets and traditional investments with the world of digital uh, currency. and. Uh, we have some uh, amazing experts with us today. I'm uh, really uh, pleased and excited uh, to introduce you to Rol Wolfert, uh, Philip Piper, Bilal El Alami, uh, Carlos Domingo, and of course, yours truly, Yoni Asia. <laughs> um, so guys, I'll let you introduce yourself uh, shortly, and then I have some uh, short questions for each one of you. Uh, not you, Yoni. Yoni, you wait a second when they introduce themselves. Let's start with you, Rol. Okay, yes, so uh, my name is Rul. Uh, for the ones that can't pronounce it, Raul will do <laughs> here in Spain. Um, 25 years in financial services technology. I held a board position at Visa, the payments company. Uh, since six years, entrepreneur and into blockchain and crypto. Um, I started getting involved in security token offerings with the first security token offering in the Netherlands in December 2017 when we felt that we needed to bring consumer and investment protection and start to drive an ecosystem for raising money and increasing liquidity in capital markets. And that's also the reason we founded Crypto Delta, which is a non-profit foundation that has the objective of building a complete ecosystem for digi digital assets going forward. Thank you. My name is Philip Piper. I'm a co-founder and council member of uh, Swarm Fund. And Swarm is an open infrastructure for um, security tokens. Uh, it spans both the issuance process, the uh, compliance process, as well as sort of post-issuance processes. Um, and uh, I was, in my former life, I was actually sort of at Deutsche Bank and Allianz Group, uh, then turned tech entrepreneur. I've been living for the past 10 years in Silicon Valley, and I actually moved back to Berlin uh, last September, and we started to expand into the European legislative environment. Uh, my name is Bilal. I'm the CEO of and co-founder of uh, Equisafe, uh, which is a technology-enabled investment bank handling tokenization, distribution, life cycle. Uh, and OTC secondary markets. Uh, we're based in Paris, and uh, two weeks ago we tokenized the first real estate asset uh, embedded in a company, uh, which we tokenized the shares and distribute them to investors. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Carlos Domingo. Um, I started in the security token space uh, very early on. At the beginning of 2017, I, I co-founded a venture capital firm called Spice VC, and we had the idea of basically you know, issuing a token that represents the LP interest in the fund uh, with the idea of automate the whole process of managing the fund with the token and provide uh, liquidity to the LPs. Um, back then, when we started, there was literally no concept of security tokens, so there was no industry or anything. Uh, so we developed our own platform, um, and then 
you know, in November 2017, when people started talking about digitizing securities on the blockchain and issuing security tokens, et cetera, then we took the decision of spanning out uh, the technology that we had built for ourselves and created a separate company called Securitize, which then I became uh, the CEO, who has been, uh, you know, one of the first players in the security token space, both in the issuance and uh, lifecycle management. We've issued many actual real security tokens. We have many of them trading on regulated exchanges uh, in the US. We're in fact the only one that has listed security tokens in, uh, in exchanges in the US. And I'm very excited to be here with all these panelists to discuss the topic. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Yves Keenan. I'm a digital asset lawyer. I'm uh, working uh, in, the, in this space. Um, and I want to tell you that I'm trying to have, uh, you know, a social impact everything that I do. Um, and this includes this panel, so we're now going to have uh, like one minute that we're discussing with Yoni Asia, the Good Dollar Project. Uh, if you just can explain for a short while what is the uh, vision behind this project, which I'm part of its team. Sure, so uh, we started a, a non-profit social impact project in Itoro called uh, the Good Dollar uh, Experiment. Uh, and what we're building is uh, a new type of cryptocurrency uh, that has two main differences uh, be separating them from the others. One is basically built in UBI or universal basic income to those who are familiar with the subject. Uh, the concept is that if every person in the world would get some money, whether it's every day or every month, you'd basically take a lot of people out of the poverty cycle. Um, and there's a lot of thought leadership around it, a lot of experiments around it. We're just creating basically a cryptocurrency where you can actually log into the blockchain and every day collect one good dollar. So one good dollar a day basically keeps the banks away. Um, and the second part is that the good dollar connects to identity. One of the uh, key issues of uh, giving UBI or being able to give and print money to people is you need to be able to identify that a person is really a unique person. Um, otherwise, uh, people would you know, open up 10,000 different accounts uh, and would try to abuse the system. Uh, so it's a cryptocurrency that basically has an identity uh, that can basically measure uniqueness, and then a UBI model that actually gives one good dollar a day for everyone. Amazing, amazing, thank you. Um, so I'd like to go back to the um, security token or um, tokens rep representing uh, securities, and to ask uh, you, Bilal, you just recently finished tokenizing a real estate, the first real estate uh, tokenization in Europe. Uh, can you share a bit about uh, this project? <coughs> uh, yeah, sure. So, so we had this wonderful 2,000 years old uh, mansion in Paris called Anna, um, which was unused for around four years, and uh, the previous owner wanted to exit. And uh, we found that guy, um, and we've been talking with him, trying to convince him to try to do a, a security token offering, and, uh, and then he accepted. So once you find the asset, a good asset, uh, you did half of the job. Uh, then the other half of the job is finding the investors, which is probably the, one of the hardest things. Uh, but we were lucky on this side because um, the two investors that we found um, unfortunately bought a house in south of France five years ago which was already sold and since then it's been five years that they were in, into blockchain and said if, if everything was blockchainized this wouldn't happen yeah um, and so we didn't have to convince them very hard so they accepted and then ca comes the technological part uh, which is very hard also uh, so we've been working on it for since March 2018, and uh, the smart contract have been audited uh, technically and legally. Uh, and we have something else in France that is very interesting: is that the regulatory framework is very proactive. We have authorized the registration and the transmission of securities on the blockchain. We have defined legally what is a blockchain, um, and the regulator has a very clear taxonomy on what is a security, what is not. 
So, so this, is a, this is really amazing, like a breakthrough project. Uh, Bil Carlos Bilal is the new kid on the block. You're the founder, I, I can say like the founder of the, one of the founders of the industry of uh, security tokens. Uh, you have many projects behind you uh, and a pipeline, I guess, like tons and more. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about Securitize and uh, what's, uh, what's your, your plans? Sure, yes, so we've been with a live platform and, and with real customers since uh, January 2018, so it's more than a year and a half ago. Um, we've also been doing the, the, providing the liquidity for security tokens, which is one of the promises, so our, our compliance protocol on the blockchain has been integrated by two of the regulated exchanges in the US, Open Finance and Shares Post, and we have recently announced that also T0 is integrating, and we have real uh, securities trading there, and I think that my experience so far is that um, this is going to take a lot longer than people expect to become a reality. You know, we, you know, things like liquidity, things like uh, you know, getting a clarity on, on regulation in different geographies and jurisdictions, etc., is something that is is moving along and is making progress. But but it's still very early days. If you think of, we have around uh, a little bit over 40 projects ongoing today, um, and if you think about how many private placements in the U.S. there were a year ago, there were like 40,000, right? So. We're not even scratching the surface about the, the potential. Um, and I still think that, you know, this is gonna take a bit longer than most people expect to, to become a reality, but it's certainly growing. Last quarter, it was the best quarter we had actually since the company was founded, signing 17 new customers. So things are trending towards the right direction, but this is still, you know, very, very early days and we're just scratching the surface. Great. Uh, Philip, uh, your uh, project Swam. Is, uh, is very interesting because it takes all kind of concepts from the, the blockchain, uh, uh, you know, world like a DAO um, and the distributed ledger. Can you explain uh, in a minute, like a bit about your project and uh, what was the what's the ideology be behind it? Well, I wouldn't talk about the ideology at this point in time. So mm -hmm. first of all, the f the the project itself is a project that actually was, um, the first attempt was in 2013, and then sort of I, uh, I came on board uh, in 2017. Uh, you know, back then it was called asset-backed tokens, now it turned into security tokens, now people talk about digital securities. That word is gonna evolve as we become more sophisticated in that space, and ultimately actually that fact that it's on the blockchain is gonna, just gonna disappear and go away. Um, we, we started off by uh, building sort of a, a stack that was on a, on a Stellar-based uh, infrastructure that was tokenizing LP positions and funds. And this was starting in uh, late 2017 um, and did a lot of learnings across the way of actually learning about uh, what the compliance requirements were, you know, how to, how to actually replicate transfer restrictions, what are the needs of the issuers in this whole process. And uh, we then actually revamped the entire infrastructure to become blockchain agnostic. So at this point in time, we actually have um, the issuance process where the issuer can decide to launch on ERC-20, for example, or on, on Stellar, but it's not, we're not imposing that onto the issuer. And I think that was a key um, differentiator in, in the way that the issuers were able to see the flexibility going forward uh, to take it to whatever place they feel most comfortable, both from a security, from a trading, from a cost perspective. Nobody knows today actually how that, um, what the predominant blockchain is gonna be in a couple of years from now. Um, we then actually sort of built a uh, distributed infrastructure that is run by 250 master nodes uh, that is called the Market Access Protocol, which covers the, the synchronization of compliance requirements. So it's, it's, it's effectively a way to keep track of, or to empower the issuer to connect with qualification providers that are industry standard qualification providers, and then make up their mind who they trust, what are the different rules and regulations they need in different territories, and that graph of information in a privacy safe way becomes a reference graph for exchanges. So we built this and designed this for a world that is not just dominated by some future centralized exchange that is gonna trade security tokens, but even we're gonna have a slew of other options with, you know, starting with decentralized exchanges, bonding curves, other, other liquidity options, and the issuer has to be empowered to be able to report to the regulatory environments that they are actually nece necessary to report to. So it's open, it's free. Yeah, it's open source, I know. I saw your GitHub, like you have a lot of uh, open source code there, and uh, 
Um, I think it's a, it's a beautiful uh, project because it takes a lot of principles from uh, you know the, the, the blockchain and uh, economy and, and world and ideology uh, and implements in it into the traditional world uh, role. Um, can you tell us about a bit about uh, Crypto Delta and what was the vision behind uh, uh, starting uh, such a venture in the Netherlands? Yes, so uh, as I just said, I, I started the first security token offering live in, in December 2017. And by doing that, we got a lot of surprises because, uh, you know, what do regulators think? Uh, is the technology going to work? How will consumers or retail investors and business side investors respond? Uh, so we got all sorts of questions like, how do you guarantee that dividend gets paid on this share? How do you make sure that uh, my vote, how does that, you know, in the voting rights, how are they going to be executed? So there were so many questions uh, that we incurred ourselves that we actually brought a lot of people together. Um, after we did the security token offering, um, a lot of people said, how did you do that? Because, you know, I have problems here. Uh, I want to do this in Liechtenstein. I want to be there for this lawyer told me this and, you know, so and so. So a lot of sort of vagueness uh, in the market when you're an entrepreneur and you're running a business, you don't want to become an expert in security tokens, right? So what we actually figured out along the way is that we brought an ecosystem together with a simple commitment, build the future of digital assets. Uh, that ecosystem includes custodians, old school banks, uh, technology firms, state of the art, blockchain, lawyers, auditors, um, you know, uh, individual contractors as well as large blue chip companies. Um, now we're doing this from the Netherlands and there's, there's a little bit of a history there that's about 500 years old because in the first stock market was launched in the Netherlands. Now I won't go into too many details there, but that brings the Netherlands as a very profound and easy to work environment uh, when it comes to regulatory or financial, uh, uh, you know, in issuing digital assets going forward. It's not perfect. And that's the second objective of Crypto Delta is actually to work with governments, regulators, and sort of shape the laws towards the future so that we keep a competitive edge and an easy environment for investors as well as for issuers of tokens to work in. Great, thank you. So I think like uh, the, one of the biggest questions people here in the audience are asking, um, security token or digital assets uh, token, why do we need it? Okay, what's, uh, you know, what's the added value that it brings to traditional economy? Um, and I think this, uh, this is a repeated question. Um, Philip, I'm gonna let you start answering this question. Look, I mean, it's, it, let's take a step back. I think we're, we're in a world that where software is eating the world. We heard this statement by in many different verticals and industries, and now it's the time to actually sort of untangle financial services. And we're, you know, security tokens is in the space of financial market infrastructure. The promise there is sort of a three-legged stool. One is, you know, the the access that you can give people access to uh, in, a, in a much leaner fashion at cheaper cost to, uh, you know, in a 24-7 market to opportunities that they may or may not have had access to before. Um, the third one, the second one is uh, sort of liquidity. So every asset that is then, you know, potentially tradable, and I'm not convinced that it's going to look and feel like we think today of crypto trading. But, you know, the, the price aspect, meaning that, you know, a market determines the price is a value increasing. It actually has for investors a huge deal of benefits when you are able to uh, liquidate a position. There's a real tangible value to that. And the third one is actually just efficiency gains. So in this whole process, um, we can collapse that whole stack of actually intermediaries. We can collapse the workflow that is necessary to pass compliance and documents from one end to the other. And that obviously becomes a very audible and very reliant and even for a regulator, a much more secure environment to, uh, to be able to endorse these kind of tradings or issuances than, than the current system is. So I think that's the most surprising uh, aha effect and when, when I talk to regulators is that we can actually prove to, to them that this is actually an environment that is beneficial to what their current state of mind is. Yes, I, yeah. I, I think, by the way, 
there is a paradox in security tokens in the entire dialogue because one of the core benefits in theory of security tokens was to reduce legal costs, right? You want to move one asset, you know, uh, whether it's private equity or property, it's very tedious work, very high costs. Uh, if you want to sell me something, we'll need a lawyer. It'll cost a lot of money, the transaction. But then suddenly now, if you want to do security tokens, you need twice the amount of lawyers and more expensive lawyers who understand security tokens to actually do something. Uh, so, so I think it's maybe it's because we're at a point in time where there are no standards yet. But right now, we try to reduce sort of the legal costs and transaction costs but they haven't been significantly reduced. The other part is liquidity, um, wh which again, we're, we're trying to figure out where is liquidity coming to security tokens because you want to say that the real benefit is you'll have liquidity, not only technology transferability, but uh, you can suddenly um, sell your, basically anything you have in real time. But if there are no buyers on the other side, and there are no exchanges that can list security tokens because there are no real regulations to enable exchanges to list security tokens, there's a big liquidity gap. Uh, and, and I think right now it's very obvious in all of the existing security tokens that are trading that there is a big gap on liquidity. We've got uh, the king of liquidity saying that uh, there's I, I want to touch on the, on the cost of things. Um, I think the, the, it's true that some lawyers today are trying to charge extra if you do a security token offering than if you do a private placement because they are that. trying to tell you this is different and therefore it's more expensive and you have to be more careful. Um, what we've been trying to do is the opposite. We've been working with uh, you know, small law firms that come particularly from the crowdfunding space that we, you know, they've worked with us in standardizing the documentation because when you've done many security token offerings, they all look and feel the same, especially if the jurisdictions you're touching and the issuance uh, place, et cetera, is the same. But then the second thing where definitely it is way cheaper is once you have a, a private security, let's say like if you have Uber shares before they went to IPO and you try to sell those Uber shares, you will have to find a broker dealer that will have engaged with an ATS, that will have to engage with a law firm to basically review all the you know, uh, you know, shares purchase agreement of your particular shares, but they also have to look at the other classes of shares, and it will take you, you know, a few weeks and a lot of money to actually sell them. And that's what happens with, you know, secondary market platforms like Shares Post, etc. Today, with security tokens, and, and this is a reality. If you go to, let's say, Open Finance and you want to buy the Spice BC token, the process is 100% automated, and it costs whatever fee the exchange wants to charge. And and the compliance and the determination whether you can sell it and whether the other person can buy it. It all happened with the smart contracts on a decentralized way on the blockchain. And that's a reality today. That alone, as you said, doesn't actually enable liquidity. You're absolutely right. But you have to think about, you know, first today, as far as I know, there is only two exchanges that trade security tokens. Open Finance is trading three exchanges, sorry. Open Finance is trading five tokens. One of them actually was listed yesterday, Protos. Um, uh, Shares Post is listing only one token, which is Blockchain Capital, and T0 is only listing their own token. So there is not enough marketplaces to, to drive uh, investor interest to go there and register. That's number one. Number two, those things have launched literally a few months ago. Open Finance launched in November, T0 launched in January. Um, so it's still you know, not something that has been around for like a year, year and a half. And, and it's, it's a very limited geographically uh, coverage as well. Like uh, Open Finance didn't open to US investors until a month ago and only for one token. So, so the entire US cannot actually trade security tokens today. So I think that it's true that, uh, you know, liquidity for security tokens is never going to be as big as for crypto assets, as Philip was mentioning. But I think that the situation today is particularly bad because of the immaturity of the of the market and how, you know, early days we are in this space. And because, you know, the, the press is bombarding us with security tokens, this and that, like you tend to think that this is more developed than it actually is. And this is still at its infancy and it's going to take another good, you know, 12 to 18 months for this to, to mature and, and, you know, have a bigger impact. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a question for the panel. This, uh, we, we were seeing sign of adoption, okay? You can't deny it. You, we have Libra, um, which is a payment system, and we know the experiment by big banks. Uh, we're tokenizing that. Uh, Carlos, I know you have a big project with IBM that uh, you're doing about tokenizing that. Uh, it was uh, published. Um, so 
my question to you is, what do we need to bring the institutionals on board? Uh, the big investors, uh, what do we need to make them feel comfortable with this industry to understand the, poten the potential of having a security token investment in private uh, companies, um, which has some liquidity and trading to it? So first you have to understand that some asset classes in the financial services world, they're very poorly digitized. Like stocks trading is very highly digitized, right? Like you can go to eToro and I'm a user there and you go and you trade or you go to uh, any you know, online trading site and you can buy and sell uh, stocks very efficiently, right? But if you think about you know, some debt instruments like whether it's corporate bonds or commercial paper or syndicated loans, those are very poorly digitized and because they're poorly digitized, there's a lot of friction in trading uh, those asset classes. So the banks, they don't see security tokens the way you know, let's say a startup see today as a way to raise money, they see as a way to basically digitize their operations. And because this trading happens between the issuer, the broker dealer, the investors, the custodian, uh, et cetera, it is very hard for them to like think about how to digitize the entire process without using some sort of distributed infrastructure, which, you know, a DLT or blockchain based infrastructure is very suitable for that. Now, what happens with the banks and with the institutions is they're still concerned about the public blockchain. We've been operating on the public blockchain and I'm a big believer that this is the future, but nevertheless, this is the public blockchain today is like the public cloud in 2005 when AWS launched. So AWS launched and all the startups embrace it. But you know, at that time I was working on a startup, we use AWS from Amazon. Then I moved to a company called Telefonica, uh, which is a Fortune 500 company. And for them, they couldn't use public cloud for a number of reasons. They didn't have SLAs. They didn't know where the data center was located. They didn't know what the data retention policies were. They didn't have guaranteed bandwidth connectivity from their offices to the data center, et cetera. So public cloud was just not there for large corporations to use it and people built private clouds and eventually public cloud became good enough and now the CIA is using AWS. So I think for institutions today to think that they're gonna issue you know, billions of dollars of assets on a public blockchain is very unrealistic. And I don't think, I'm, I've talked to all the banks and I don't think this is gonna happen. They're gonna start using blockchain in a permission-based scenario, similar to what Facebook is doing with Libra, all the initiatives out there, like what we're doing with IBM. And that's how they're gonna get familiar with the technology, understand the benefits, you know, start digitizing their processes and eventually, you know, move into the public blockchain. Yeah, I think, um I think it's gonna be it's gonna take uh, a couple of like missing linchpins or gaps that to close and uh, this is actually happening under the hood people are not realizing how big of an engagement actually the institutions are showing at this point in time so while the market is so focused on actually the, the crypto bear market and uh, all these aspects of, of, of the crypto market actually the the banks have uh, recognized last year that this is this is happening and these are hedge funds and banks and other players that are saying listen the, we, we know that we're inefficient in some ways we know that actually there is a lot of gains in reaching investors more directly in a more automated way. Uh, we don't want to have that Kodak moment happen to us. And so um, we, we as an industry, we will win uh, if we make this whole process smell and feel like a normal investment process. If the trust involved is there, if the processes are there, if the documentation is there, if the comfort zone with legal processes and regulatory processes are there. And um, let's recognize that there's been a, a lot of progress being made in the last six months on the regulatory side where people have started to really define these things. You know, we've seen you know, a number of very interesting uh, sort of statements by the SEC and FINRA uh, on the broker dealer and custodian side. We've seen actually FATF, which is a challenge in itself on the travel rule of exchanges. Um, but it, it's coming to the mind and, and there's answers being developed uh, that you know, are necessary for institutions to gain uh, comfort around this. So if we can make that a cheap process that is you know, more cost efficient than the process today, so if we can give a bond issuance from, you know, in London from 400,000 pounds down to 40,000 pounds all in, that is a winning argument for them. If then subsequently, actually the regulator gains a lot more comfort with what this industry is like and the players involved and the regulatory licensing processes of custodians, et cetera, then we've successfully actually convinced the, the industry. Um, I, I personally spoke to a number of uh, fund administration platforms, some of which actually have multiple thousands of funds and they're planning, very tangibly planning, that within the next 18 months, there's a good portion of that that is going to be tokenized. Um, now, that's maybe on permission of blockchains that, not, that doesn't fulfill all the promises of what we've been discussing about security tokens. But at the same time, it's a, it's a very significant start that is sort of the untangling of that space as well, where it's no longer about being a middleman as a player in that space, but really servicing the customer at the highest degree of efficiency. 
So Bilal, Rol, I want to understand what, what are the assets that we're going to be you're going to see tokenized first. Uh, Bilal, you were you did tokenization of real estate. I personally am a big believer in tokenization of real estate. Um, I know more than one project that's uh, going that way. Um, but uh, Philip, for example, uh, did an art tokenization, okay, uh, which is which is also mind blowing. The idea that you can have like an artwork which is uh, non-liquid, and then you can divide it into fractionize it into like small portions, and then sell it um, and have it uh, liquid. So which were the, which are the assets that you uh, feel that's going to be tokenized first? Real estate, for sure. Uh, we see it. Um, we see it every day. Real estate people, whether they are fund, real, real estate, commercial real estate funds or promoters, they're looking for new financing uh, models. Um, because all the big constructor and, co and, and promoters in, in, in real estate, they are taking all the market. And we've been talking with many of them, and everyone says the same thing. When we reach 250 million um, income, we cannot go over because all the big contracts, they're taken by, by, by the big companies. Um, so all the small promoters from 2050 and, 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 and less, uh, they're really looking for new financing models. They're looking for innovation because they're doing the same processes for so long. And, 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 and it's good with blockchain because blockchain redistributes the cards. And, uh, and, and we can come back to the vision of Equisafe. At Equisafe, we say it needs to be as easy to buy a book on Amazon as to invest. And we are changing the responsibility of the choice and the visit. Today, if you want to buy a real estate asset on your own, you need to be aware of what are the offerings. Uh, the process takes three to six months. Uh, you need to have some income. And we say, let, let this work to the promoter. And you will have multiple choice. And in three clicks, you can buy. And, and that's the vision that we, we try to, to push. And I want to answer the previous question on, on the institutional getting into crypto. Um, there are a lot of building blocks that are still missing. Not enough stable coins, not enough regulatory, um, uh, regulatory rules on the custodian, on the insurance of these custodians. And without this, they're not going into the space. Um, and so we need more small projects so I, I'm, I'm gonna stay humble and, and not compare myself to securitize because they are the leader and, and, and I know Carlos for for almost a year now and, uh, and I love what they're doing um, but in France we need to start with 1 million less than 1 million six less than 8 million operation to show that it can be done uh, to give access to investors to leverage the exemption case and then you can go to institutional and ask them to tokenize one, one billion new seats. Uh, but before multiple try, they're not going to get in. How come that uh, in traditional market, for example, when I was a securities lawyer, we did an IPO, you come you know, to the secondary market and you basically list your shares. How come that in this market we have a primary market and then a secondary market? At the primary market, which you are representing, um, my question is, didn't we get it wrong? Like, didn't we ha would start with a secondary market like any tour platform and then build our way down, uh, allowing people to, uh, to list their tokens? So, so from, I mean, you're a lawyer, so you know this better than me, but from a regulatory perspective, if you have a, a, you know, a private placement, you can't mix the private placement with the secondary trading through an ATS of the same, you know, security. So these are separated by... Uh, you know, at least in the U.S., from a regulatory construct, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, because as you said, you could think of like what the today the exchanges are doing with this uh, initial exchange offering that you could do it for security tokens, right? You go and you list directly on Open Finance, and people buy the token, and your offering becomes kind of like your your IPO. But that, from a regulatory perspective, that's not possible uh, today because the the uh, you know the rules that apply are the ones related to private placements. Uh, I, I guess what's going to see, and we're seeing here in Europe, because as Bilal said. European market seems to be more uh, forward thinking in terms of regulation than the US markets is that they, you're getting some people that have offerings that have been approved by the regulator. 
And then when the offering is approved, and it's a registered security, and not an unregistered security, then you can do a lot more things, like you know, direct listings and, and things like that. Uh, in Europe, obviously, you have all the problems, like you need a CSD and you need all the stuff, but uh, I think that um, we will see those things coming as soon as regulators start like being more flexible with approving offerings. I think there's a lot of things to figure out still on the secondary side. I mean, it's um, you know we're, we're rooting for everyone to actually come with efficient marketplaces that have a lot of participants. But the reality is that you know there's a lot of stifling that is happening from a regulatory side uh, with regards to actually licensing processes around that. It starts with the custodian. It goes to you know the question you know what is a multi-trading facility and how does it get licensed in this space? Um, and then the, the the core question to me is like um, w why should there be a clearinghouse? Like this concept that is coming from the traditional financial market has it has had its purpose there, and it, it has its good purpose there. Um, but the problem is that in in a in a in a blockchain world, you could actually live without that. You could because it actually is fully settled and transparent on the blockchain. You don't necessarily need a third party to do that uh, in 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 an offline world in the in the vaults, right? And so I think these concepts are starting to marinate with the regulators. They're they're starting to be convinced of of the fact, and we have to we all together have to do sort of uh, regulatory blueprinting. So we have to we have to come up with assets that actually have a good nature to them. We have to show that these are adopted by investors. We have to show that there is a efficiency in the process and that the security and the reporting on those those processes are satisfying to the regulator. I think that's the only way how to make progress on the on the agenda of actually getting regulators comfortable around a more global, more flexible market around these issues. Well, what is interesting as well is that I, what we see in the Netherlands that primary market trading is a huge business case in itself. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of money to be made. So if, if uh, a company tokenizes itself, simply by tokenizing, creating the liquidity, you increase the value by a valuator with about 10% of your company. Just by tokenizing your shares, that is an easy win. Then you don't take the bank loan, you take the assets. So you turn your balance sheet around. So that is happening. And then for VCs, that take a stake of 500k or a million or something like that, they can trade amongst each other in primary markets. So, and for VCs, liquidity on a you know a more interactive basis rather than a deal-making basis that could cost maybe 100k to make that deal, uh, they can do it now for 25 cents. So, so Carlos, you uh, actually tokenize Spice VC, right? Um, so can you uh, share a bit about the process and like what's the potential of having a tokenized venture capital? So for us, the, the main original idea was to provide uh, liquidity uh, to the LP interest because we felt that, you know, if you think about what a, a venture capital is, is basically a blind pool when you give money to someone for seven to ten years and you just wait there for them to, you know, successfully return you some money, you know, after a long time, right? Um, if you could actually... And, and the fact that VC is structured that way it makes it a very small asset class. Like if you look at the portfolio of an asset manager, the allocation they will put to venture capital is usually a very, very small percentage because if it's an extremely risky and illiquid asset. So we felt that if you can eliminate the illiquidity portion, at least reduce it because liquidity is not black and white. So it's, it's not that there is or there's not, it's th there's degrees. Then you could then potentially convince more people to invest on, on venture capital because they could exit the investment you know, without having to wait seven to 10 years. Um, you know, when we started in, you know, in summer 2017, this, this whole thing was a, a dream, right? Nothing existed. There, there was no issuance platforms. There was no uh, security compliance protocols. There was no secondary market trading, but we believe that this was gonna happen. And in fact, it's happening. It's just taking a lot longer than we initially expected, uh, especially on the liquidity side. We took the conscious decision not to be uh, a secondary market provider um, because we felt that we will want to partner with all of them. And therefore, if you become one of them, you're competing and they will not partner with you. So stay only on serving the issuer as the, the primary issuer, uh, issuance and the management of the security ones on the blockchain. But then the, the exchanges, the reality is it's been taking a lot longer to, to launch and to have liquidity. So I have a last question. It's a tricky question, so thanks, uh, you know, think well before you answer. Um, I'm gonna say a sentence, okay? And I want you to relate to it uh, on a vision side, like show your vision. And the sentence is, in the future, everything that can be tokenized will be tokenized, just not the way you think, okay? And when I say not the way you think, I mean, not the jurisdiction that you think that tokenization is going to take place. 
um, and uh, not by the methods that you think that tokenization will take place. And please, you know, share your vision about the market, also relating to like the timeline when it's going to happen. I think that generally, and again, our view on eToro is the first thing that needs to be tokenized are the existing assets that we have today in the world, which are the existing public markets, existing companies. So we're, we're looking at it from a vision point of view as securities, public markets, fiat currencies, commodities, all of that is going to be tokenized and therefore people will be able to trade that basically uh, in, the, in the same way that they can trade crypto assets and exchange crypto assets. Uh, then the second part is new type of assets. Um, and you know, our, our, our vision is basically whatever assets you guys can produce, so we'll, we'll be happy to list it. Uh, so basically whatever we can give our clients, if that's an opportunity, we'd want to enable our clients to trade anything from anywhere at any time. Star also startups, for example? Yeah, yeah? definitely. Okay, interesting. So uh, I'm, instead of saying you know, everything will be tokenized, I'm gonna just change a little bit the, 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 the wording. I will say everything will be digitized. So, and so far, there's many industries that 100% has been digitized and have opened up, you know, new usages. Like music is a good example, right? So, so music has been 100% digitized and with internet distribution on top of it, then now it, people consume music in an entirely different way and the industry has nothing to do with the industry 20 years ago. So I think that the financial services industry will be fully digitized, 100%. Now, whether that's in the form of token or not token or blockchain, what part will be blockchain, what not, that's the, the thing that maybe is a bit uh, blurry for me. But I also think that it's going to take a lot longer than people expected because when you digitize music, if a Spotify, you know, screws with the streaming and you're not getting your, uh, you know, your music, you know, nothing happens, right? But with financial services, if you're a screw and you're selling securities to someone that you shouldn't be selling or if you lose your pension or if you cannot pay when you go to a dinner, etc., these are things that touch a, a part of the society that, you know, is more complex, right? So I think you know, the, the whole process of digitizing financial services, including, you know, security tokens, et cetera, is going to take a lot longer than people expect. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm reminding you of my question. My question was, uh, everything's going to be tokenized, but not the way you think. <laughs> and what I'm trying to get you is to speak about, uh, you know, the jurisdictions that are emerging, which are not necessarily Europe or the US. Uh, perhaps it could be like the Asia, um, jurisdictions and, and, um, and, and way that are innovative uh, um, to do a tokenization. So, you know. I, th I, I disagree with that statement. So I think the, whether a jurisdiction is very innovative, let's say like Malta or Gibraltar, and you can tokenize there, that has, doesn't actually solve the problem because to, to make the reality of security tokens, you need to be able to sell them to investors globally. And then that means that every single jurisdiction where you have one investor has to be friendly as well. So just because there's some jurisdictions where it's easier to tokenize, it doesn't actually mean that, you know, it will tokenize successfully because investors will not be necessarily on that jurisdiction. They will be all over the world, so. Um, I totally agree with Carlos with the vocabulary that we use. Um, every blockchain vocabulary needs to disappear. Uh, we don't need to, we shouldn't talk about wallets, we should talk about accounts, we should talk about digital securities and not security tokens. All the blockchain, um, nobody cares. And when you talk, it only troubles the people. Um, and then I will add that... Um, people are expecting the US to be the biggest market, um, but I don't think that's the best market uh, for, secur for digital securities. This, the reason is simple. Um, today, at the government level, and we see it in France and in Europe when we talk with the Commission, um, they are way more business oriented than they used to be. They know that they lost the war on internet, they're losing the war on artificial intelligence, and now blockchain is one of the last chains they have to catch up. And all the countries that are very late technologically, they will try to bridge the gap like Africa bridges the gap with the banking. They don't have cards, they, they use their phones. Yeah, yeah. In China too, they use their phones and, and uh, 
And it makes me so uh, surprised that in France, we don't have still this user experience of using, using the phones and still using credit cards. So, um, and I won't say that Europe is gonna, is gonna be one of the major actors, but um, the yeah. I think he will, it will, because even, even though Africa, you don't have enough regulatory frameworks and um, regulators and, and people who decide, everything is too shady over there. Um, so I would say that Europe and all small countries within Europe or Asia that have accumulated um, some delays on their technologic innovation development at the state level will be one of the major so actors. Ama amazing, amazing input. Thank you very much, Philip. Okay, so so th three. You, you're both are vibe. You know, you you know, Europe. You're very Europe uh, centric. <laughs> So, uh, so three topics, right? It's, it's regulatory, it's what asset classes, and then actually who are the mm -hmm. actors. Um, so on the regulatory side, I'm 100% I'm with Carlos and the pre predecessors speaking um, that as much as it's about regulatory arbitrage today, which means that how can you create something in an environment that actually starts to endorse it, starts to understand it, ultimately it's about counterparty risk. So the institutional, uh, institutional players are gonna adopt only those environments that they feel comfortable adopting because they always have that legal counterparty that they have to be comfortable with. And that has nothing to do with cryptography. So ultimately, um, what we're doing is, you know, all together in markets, regulatory ice breaking, we're showing that it's working, we're showing that it's for the benefit of the actors, that it's actually with the comfort of the regulators, um, and then that will ultimately lead to others adopting as well. The interesting piece is to observe um, that the US has an entanglement that makes it pretty impossible to move fast amongst the agencies and the states and the federal level. Um, in Europe, there's an interesting situation evolving with you know, Brexit and the European Union um, actually spri splitting from one another. So there's a lot of necessity of actually sort of, you know, moving into areas that have innovation potential and that actually can capture the, uh, the money flows that are, are, are coming in the future. So we'll see what that actually brings. Um, I think that um, some, some will evolve as interesting environments, uh, like in the fund space, Cayman and BVI always was, you know, some part of the, the capturing. I think similar will happen here in this space, but yeah. ultimately the big ones will adopt. Secondly, assets. Um, I, I personally, I don't think that a, a startup with all the execution and other risk should be actually a public asset, just because investors always live off of information asymmetry. But that's my personal opinion. I think what people will see is that there's a lot more big asset classes that are coming to this ecosystem. So if, if, if actually the industry says that STOs are a prolongation of ICOs, it couldn't be further from the truth, right? Yeah. This is actually the ex exact extreme other end that actually sees the, the biggest benefits in this. So we're talking about, you know, big debt asset classes, you know, from T-bills to corporate bonds. We're okay. talking about, you know, I'm, I'm not so convinced about, you know, real estate just taking off because there's a lot of conservative players in that as well. But we're gonna see the biggest illiquid asset classes, you know, pre-IPO tech stock, for example. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have to conclude the panel, so Raul, last, uh, last sentence uh, before we conclude. Yeah, so let, let's talk, uh, talk about a dream then rather than a vision. So let's say that my grandchildren, when they get born at birth, can capitalize on the future value they will create in life and therefore never have to worry about debt or anything like that. And that is the world I'd love to live in. And that means that we need to go to economical reform, moving away from a Keynesian inflation model towards a new economic system, where I think we will get a more equal spread of income and wealth going forward, and recognition of potential and value. Now, your question was if, like, what does that happen on a regulatory aspect? Now, I, this is also a little bit more hope, and we will see what happens in reality in the coming years. Um, I think Europe has launched a tactic against, let's say, the Americas and Asia, China, to put in regulation like GDPR that then has so much impact on businesses operating from Asia into Europe or from America into Europe that they have to comply. When I was in the board of your uh, visa, we set new interchange prices with the European Committee. That simply meant that a global bank operating from Australia, first of all, saw very low prices in Europe. And guess what they did in their local market? They said, we want that here too. So if Europe 
keeps with this legal strategy of sort of fast deploying sensible laws in Europe from a sort of semi-socialist perspective, and I know that's sort of a big word, but I think we will be able to influence a better world also when it comes to digitalization, security tokens, and everything that comes around. Amazing. That. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, distinguished guests of this panel. Um, and uh, the panel is concluded. <laughs>